kind introduction. Uh, yes, I did start out back uh, a long time ago thinking I was going in the field of psychology and was in my master's program before I changed gears. When I always had an interest in, uh, um, in uh, mental illness and challenges, and that actually was a kind of an exciting time when there was a push on for talking like early 70s of deinstitutionalization, both for people with special needs and from the state psychiatric hospitals. And I found uh, my interest being more in the policy and legal side of what was happening, uh, which led me into this field. Always had a uh, focus on dealing with the challenges of incapacity and disability, which interesting led me to the field after they had it. You know, when I first started practicing, there was no field of, quote, elder law. Elder law is the field that where people, uh, where attorneys specialize in understanding public benefits and incapacity and disability, how those things fit together and how you fit it together with estate planning. It's not like there are challenges, additional challenges, as we'll see, to uh, in addition to normal estate planning. So the elder law attorney has an understanding uh, of those. Uh, when I first started practicing, there really wasn't even a word for for people that focused on, I called it mental health law sometimes, various terms, or you just had to use a couple of sentences to explain what you do. Now we have a field, though the term elder law sometimes uh, confuses people to thinking it's only with the dealing, uh, dealing with uh, the elderly. Yes, the elderly do have challenges of incapacity and disability and uh, access to public benefits programs that they're eligible for, but they're not the only ones. In any event, I'm very uh, happy to be here uh, today with the International uh, Bipolar Foundation to talk about special needs planning, which is the field that deals with this, and having the right legal tools. Um, our game plan today, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. We're first gonna take a quick look at something called the ABLE Act, uh, which you may have heard uh, about. It's relatively new. Um, and it offers, uh, it's, it's another tool in the toolbox. We'll see how that fits. We're going to then look at estate planning, uh, both in general and then with a particular focus on the challenges for families where you're planning with somebody with disabilities or if you're a disabled person uh, yourself and planning for your own needs. We're going to look at how these two things integrate with each other. And finally, a quick look uh, at conservatorships and alternatives to conservatorship. That's a lot to cover. We have an hour to cover it in. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, I don't mind questions as we go on. If you ask a question, I may know, since I know what's coming up, I may know the answer to that question. It's a few slides down the road, in which case I'll just tell you hold that thought. If it's very specific, I may suggest that you wait and see me afterwards. I will hang on afterwards. So if you have a question that seems more personal or specific, you can hold that as well. Other than that, if there's something that's not clear, uh, happy to entertain, uh, happy to entertain questions. So, let's start again with the ABLE Act. Well, what does that mean? Well, it stands for Achieving Better Life Experiences. Uh, many of you may have heard of this. It's been tracked by most disability organizations for six, seven years. That's when it first went into uh, Congress. Uh, it had a lot of tinkering and uh, it didn't quite come out the way it uh, went in. It did have broad support from a lot of community disability organizations. Uh, most organizations have had little blurbs about this in their newsletter as it was working its way through the system. Um, it's, adoption is optional by the states uh, and California certainly will adopt it, has adopted it. They haven't gone through all the process of the, uh, of, uh, the regulation, so it's not really up and running yet in California. About four or five states now it is up and running. And actually they did some amendments recently so people can opt into uh, other states. Uh, so, as I said though, what went into the system, what people thought they were getting is not quite what they got. So, that's the, and as a friend of mine said about this quote, sometimes that's, a, that's an insult to honest sausage makers everywhere. Uh, so, 
what was did we think the ABLE Act might be, or what was it? Uh, uh, what were the advocates looking for? Well, a model based on what we call 529 plans. These are college savings plans. Some of you may be familiar with. You can put money in for your kid's college expense, uh, and it will uh, grow without being taxed, so like an IRA or a 401k. So that's that's a good thing. And it takes, even when unlike an IRA, when it comes out, it's not taxed either, assuming you utilize it for a qualified uh, educational expense. So families dealt with disability thought, well, what about, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was something uh, for my child that may not be a family member uh, able to go to college, but something that can address disability issues? Uh, as well, modeled along the same. So that was the concept, family could contribute to it. Um, the individuals themselves might be able to uh, contribute to them and they would, as I say, grow tax free. Uh, the assets and the accounts, the point was that they won't interfere with public benefits eligibility as well as the fact that they would grow tax free. It would be kind of an alternative, uh, if it was done correctly, to what we refer to as special needs trust, something we'll talk about a little later. Well, well again, it didn't quite come out the way it went in. Uh, there are limitations, only one able count to a person. It's not a big deal. There are limitations on who is a qualified disabled person. That will impact um, uh, people with bipolar more than it would many other disabilities. And many other groups I speak to, uh, um, one of the limitations on the definition of a disabled person as it came out was that the onset had to be uh, age 26 or earlier. Now, that may fit your facts and in many disabilities, and certainly developmental disabilities, that's easy to prove and easy to establish. Less so with some psychiatric disabilities. So that could be a challenge. There are limitations. Yes, ma'am. So are you saying uh, bipolar disorder does qualify or does not? I'm saying one of the limitations is on the definition of disability. And if you have a disability that has been diagnosed before age 26, you qualify for an ABLE account. Whether or not your family, so, so you know, I can't tell you. I mean, if somebody asked me if I was giving a talk to a Down syndrome group, I'd say, you know, your diagnosis is clear. It's developmental. This is something that onset clearly at birth. Bipolar? I don't know. It would be your facts. It would be fact related because you're going to have to be able to establish the onset of that disability prior to that age. Some of you may be able to do that. That might be a challenge for others. Prior to age 26. Pardon? Prior. prior. Onset prior to age 26. There's limitations on annual contributions and there's limitations on the total contributions, limitations on the use of withdrawals. Um, all those were somewhat expected. What wasn't expected is the uh, loss of SSI benefits once that account builds up to more to $100,000 or more. So that's a problem. And the biggest problem is something we call a payback clause. So we'll take a look at all those things in a little more detail here. So. Contributions, again, so that it can be made by any person, including the disabled beneficiary. Uh, there is only one ABLE account. There can be no more than $14,000 per year put in that account. Not per person, per anybody who's contributing. So, I mean, if people, you could go over that if different people are contributing and don't realize what's happening. It can only be $14,000 in that account per year. They're going to a lifetime cap too. That's less of a problem. Um, it's the same as it is with 529 plans. That currently the math works out to about $371,000 a year. That's uh, not as much of a limitation. But that $14,000 a year, that's not quite what we had hoped for. Uh, withdrawals, I won't get too much into this, but uh, withdrawals will not be taxed as long, I see, I'll be right to you, as long as it's for a qualified disability expense. Uh, there is a, a, a list uh, of those expenses, but it's fairly common sense. Uh, if, you have a dis if you have a withdrawal from that account that's not for one of the qualified disability expenses, that will be taxed as income, uh, and it will get a 10% penalty too. 
uh, just like an early withdrawal from an IRA. I have a little example for that. You were uh, tax uh, experts or more math-minded down below here uh, in your literature how that works. Yes, sir. Well, the maximum, two numbers to worry about. One, once it gets to 100000 whether it's contribution or growing, once it gets to $100,000, uh, you're not eligible for SSI anymore if somebody was on SSI. Uh, so that's one limit. The other limit is a contribution limit. You can only contribute... Uh, there's a lifetime cap on contributions. Right now, that would be $371,000. It could grow over that, but the contribution limit is $371,000. So you're saying that the, the maximum, you said there was a total maximum, but it could still grow above that? Yes. Yes, but the maximum contributions would be $371,000. But again, remember, that's $14,000 a year. So that would, I could do the math of how many years that would have to. B. Whoops. Um, another potential danger of non-disability withdrawals in addition to the taxation and the penalty is that uh, there's a suggestion that it could cause the loss of that account as an exempt asset by Medi-Cal. And if that is counted towards uh, as somebody's asset, then that's probably going to be more than $2,000 and bump them off of their Medi-Cal. So that's, that's a concern. And a reason for people to be careful. As I said, if the account goes over $100,000, uh, the SSI payments will stop. You're not going to lose your Medi-Cal in that case, so that's good news, uh, unless you exceed the total $371,000, but you will stop the SSI. All of these limitations, Paul, in, to, uh, in face of the payback one, though, um, there is going to be a Medi-Cal payback clause in these. So any assets in that account at the death of the beneficiary of it are subject to payback to the state of California for any Medi-Cal benefits paid during their life. Now this is similar to what we call a provision in a, uh, well, Medi-Cal has an estate recovery program for people with benefits, and they recover from what we call first party special needs trust. We'll talk about this a little bit more down the line. There is no situation, however, other than this, where what we call third party money, that is money that a parent contributes to an account uh, for somebody's benefit, is subject to a payback clause. So this is a big issue and a potential problem. So, that's our little thumbnail of the ABLE Act. Uh, I said we'd take a look at the ABLE Act and how it's going to work. Now we're going to take a look at estate planning and how that works, both your family estate planning and the challenges for people uh, who have a family member with a disability. So, the bigger picture is we're asking the question, how do we provide consistent care and support for people with disabilities? Oh, that's the big picture, and not, and shouldn't lose. And then that's not just a family issue, that's, that's an issue for uh, our whole country and culture. Uh, every country faces this, every culture faces this, some better than others. Here, basically, there are four ways I've delineated that that might be accomplished. One is what we call entitlement benefits. Entitlement benefits are things that you have earned, you have become entitled to. Most common one in the United States is social security benefits, which you earn by working, or possibly can claim through somebody who earned by working. It's the sweat of your brow that makes you entitled to that. Your assets and income are irrelevant. Means-tested benefits. Those are benefits, not that you earn, but that you are uh, receive because of your age, blind, or have a disability, and you have financial need. These are the social safety net. These are where 
we as a society say we will provide for those who because of age or disability cannot provide for themselves. You don't have to have earned them. Earnings, personal earnings, and, uh, which, uh, and finally, family resources. So these really are the four things that uh, somebody with disability might be uh, looking at, or, or frankly, any of us. Um, so let's take a closer look at public benefits, the first two, the entitlement and the means tested. And sometimes means tested are called either needs-based or means tested, means the same thing. This is an important concept that a lot of people uh, uh, never really have had it broken out for them. As I said, two types of government programs. Entitlement, again, ones that you earn. There are actually four social security programs. We all think of retirement. Uh, there's also uh, survivors, dependents, and disability. Social security, disability. Again, these are things people vest in through a work history. Usually your own work history, not necessarily. Uh, Social Security Disability has a program called Disabled Adult Child. So if you can establish the onset of disability age 19 or earlier, that person can collect through the work history of their parent once their parent either retires, passes, or becomes disabled. That's a little known fact, but that typically uh, is a, a for most people, a higher benefit than SSI. Um, on the other side, the most common one, SSI, Supplemental Security Income. It is not an entitlement program. Again, it's a welfare model program for people in need, financial need, and who are aged or disabled. Um, it's a little confusing. It's not the same as Social Security. It's not an entitlement program. People get confused because uh, uh, it's administered by the Social Security Administration, so the you know, check on auto deposit says SSA, just like somebody's uh, Social Security check would, but it is different. Each of these two constructs, each of these two types of programs has its own connected health insurance program. For your entitlement programs, it is Medicare. For your needs-based program, it is Medicaid, or as we have called it in California, Medi-Cal. Now again, for these entitlement programs, such as Social Security disability, assets and income are irrelevant. Bill Gates could collect Social Security disability, should he be disabled and want to apply, uh, and get Medicare. Not so SSI. There you have to show uh, limited income and limited assets. Any questions about that? Are you yes. eligible for Medi-Cal without being an SSI? Yes. question was, are you eligible for Medi-Cal or can you be without being on SSI? Absolutely. If somebody is on SSI, they are automatically eligible for Medi-Cal. Uh, we're what we call a categorically eligible state. So let's say uh, for given a particular person for a particular living situation, the uh, SSI limit is 800, 875. So if you have less than 875 uh, income, you might be eligible. Uh, there are programs for uh, uh, Medi-Cal where you can be eligible up to around $1,200 income. So people can be, have too much income in a month to be eligible for SSI, but still get zero share of cost Medi-Cal directly. They won't get that check that SSI sends, but they will get the health care benefits. And some people, by the way, are on both. You might have heard of Medi-Medi or dual eligible. These are people, what SSI does is it, again, let's say the benefit is uh, uh, for a particular person in a situation is 875. If you have zero income, they'll send you a check for 875. If you have $400 worth of other income, such as Social Security income or a pension, they'll send you a check for 475. If you have $874 of income, they'll send you a check for a dollar. As long as you get that dollar, you get the Medi-Cal too. So that's how they work. So people might be on. Yes? You 
Yes, you mentioned uh, age for the child 19, so they qualify for the kind of social security. Yeah. I thought it was 22. Uh, for the DAC program? Uh, I can double check that. It, it is. It is 22. It is 22? Well, stand corrected. Used to be 19. Uh, good. And it's a great program. Uh, and, and people very often don't realize that somebody, you know, as long as the parents are working uh, and not collecting on their own Social Security, you can't do this. But once one of the parents is deceased or collecting themselves, then the child can step in and collect under that parent's work history. So can you clarify that, so that if the child is diagnosed before the age of 22, then if the parents pass, they can collect their parents' Social Security? Is that what? They can collect disability under their work history, under the parent's work history, if they don't have their own work history sufficient to invest in the program. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do we how do you get that going? Yeah, you go down to the Social Security Administration and apply for it. They'll walk you through okay. the process. Uh, very often people... We've already started our SSI applications. Yeah. So. Well, uh, again, this is nothing you can do prospectively if, uh, for instance, you're talking about a child? Yeah. Yeah, well, if you and your husband are both still working, if you're not, if, you're, if neither of you are disabled yourself collecting Social Security under one of its programs, mm -hmm. your child can't do that yet. But it's there. It's there waiting for them kind of like, okay. you know, later yeah, yeah. When, when you're no longer, uh, fortunately, if that day comes and you're no longer working and you're collecting your Social Security. And is there also a maximum amount of that on a monthly basis? It's based on the work history of the parent. So it could be a small amount that needs to be supplemented by SSI, being that it's less than the SSI, or it could be a relatively large amount if that uh, parent's work history was enough to vest at one of the higher levels of Social Security. So estate planning. So what do we want to do with estate planning? Well, basically, we're trying to uh, retain control over our life decisions. We're trying to provide both for our own care, uh, should we become disabled, um, we are trying to preserve as much of our assets as possible in the face of disability and uh, also be able to select upon our death where our assets go and how they go there. Uh, the solution to that, the way to accomplish that is what we call the integrated estate plan. Um, there is unfortunately no one document I can do that accomplishes, protects uh, on all the fronts. And this slide helps explain that. You may have heard of trusts. Uh, most people will benefit from the trust. Certainly if you live in San Diego County and you have a, own a home, you probably would benefit from a trust. Uh, a trust allows easy management for the property uh, during your life that's in the trust should you become disabled. I mean, as long as you're have all your capacity, you're managing your own trust, you wouldn't notice any difference from an uh, asset in or outside of the trust, but it offers a good mechanism for managing it if you become disabled. We'll take a look at that in a few minutes. Um, and upon your death, it gets to provide as to how, how the uh, uh, assets go. Not all assets may be in your trust, though. You may have assets that are outside of the trust. The trustee of your trust has no control over assets that are outside of your trust. So trust isn't going to help there. Uh, that's where you need a financial power of attorney. Likewise, the agent under that power of attorney has no control over assets in the trust. So during your life, if you want somebody to be able to manage assets both in and outside of your trust, then you need two documents, the trust and the financial power of attorney. The financial power of attorney ends at your death. It vanishes. So if you want a document that instructs how to handle assets not in your trust after your death, then you need a will, or what we call a pour-over will. If you've got a trust, we call them pour-over wills. That means uh, Essentially what it does in that case is it says, if there are any assets that aren't in my trust, I pass them on over to my trust. It's kind of like a safety net there. And as long as the total of assets that are uh, uh, passing under the will are less than $250,000, there's no probate and it's very simple 
process to transfer on over the trust. But again, there you see for the finances, there's three documents that are needed to cover all the possibilities in and outside of the trust, during your life, and after your death. Three documents. Plus health care, powers of attorney, and direct booths. So you can say who would be making health care decisions for you if you can't, and what guidelines you want to give them. So those are the four documents that are part of the integrated estate plan. And together they cover all the bases, finances, while you're alive, after your death, and health care. Typically most attorneys' estate plans will have various ancillary documents along with that. Uh, things, uh, HIPAA waivers for confidentiality, assignments of property, things called certificate. Various things that make the administration for the people that are uh, are helping you if you become disabled, make their job easier. Uh, but these are the four core documents. Now, if you have a family member with a disability or special needs, you've got some extra challenges. <coughs> you don't want anything you do in your estate plan. And remember, one of those four things about how do we support people with disability, uh, one of those four things were family resources. You don't want an inheritance to interfere with their eligibility for public benefits. I mean, what good does that do? You leave some money and all of a sudden somebody loses their SSI. Uh, so you want to do it in a way that preserves eligibility. You want to supplement their public benefits, not replace them. You want the uh, trustee probably to be able to have, or you may want them to have authority to continue to do the things you're doing for your child with disability when you are also disabled. An example would be, let's say again, you become disabled. Most trusts I see are silent on that and therefore the trustee has no authority. What I mean by that is they will say, if I become disabled, or my spouse and I become disabled, then the trustee shall manage these. Then the successor trustee steps in and manages these resources for me. Well, typically, uh, that's not going to include supporting an adult child or offering or being able to use those trust assets in any way, shape, or form for anybody else other than the people who establish that trust. If you want that, you've got to spell it out. So again, that's a consideration for people who have uh, adult children that they might want to still have their resources in the state be available on a case needed basis. Uh, handling bequests from other family members. Uh, what I mean by that is you might have a trust that sets it up so it is supplementing and not replacing benefits and all of a sudden uh, grandma uh, leaves a death benefit to somebody and they lose their SSI. So, it's, uh, uh, that's another challenge to make sure everybody's on the same page in estate planning. Uh, assuring the right people are making decisions down the road, both for you and uh, uh, anybody that, uh, who has disability who would be a beneficiary under your estate plan, and that you have provided the necessary instructions to those people so they understand your value, your, your values, and uh, the challenges is only you can explain it about the uh, special needs family member. Uh, and also the challenge to assure there are adequate resources. This is particularly a challenge for younger people who are doing estate planning for a child with disability. Uh, they know, they may have on faith that they'll be able to adequately do that later. Uh, less so, how do we provide for a lifetime? So. One of the problems is your standard family revocable trust offers no protection for assets that are, would be given to somebody from being treated, counted by SSI as an available asset and disqualifying them. So you've got to be careful what you are doing. Special needs trusts are a vehicle where they can with the right language, hold assets in that trust without affecting those public benefits programs and uh, can provide for that beneficiary so they still have the benefit of uh, that, that money in addition to their public benefits without it disqualifying them. But you've got to have that language in your trust. Uh, just leaving them the money outright uh, is not going to do the trick. You've got to plan for it. 
Now, most of you, I would say, have you, have, uh, who has not heard the, con the uh, phrase special needs trust before? See, there are a couple of people, but most people have heard about special needs trust. Um, there's really two kinds. There's what we call first parties. There's more than that, but this is a useful construct. First party special needs trust and third party, or other trust, sometimes we call them. A first party special needs trust is a trust established with the assets of the disabled person or their spouse. Now those are pretty restrictive. And you can understand from a policy point why. The government doesn't want somebody to uh, be able to transfer all their assets for a trust where they can still get to it and, and then say, oops, I'm poor now, I'm eligible for benefits. So they have some very strict rules on those trusts. The most onerous of which is what we call a payback clause, which says if there's any assets left in that trust when it terminates, either by termination or death, that you have to pay the state back for what they have paid in Medi-Cal or Medicaid benefits. Uh, and there are other restrictive terms in it. However, a trust established by anybody other than that individual, the individual on the benefits or their spouse, is not a first party special need trust. It is a third party special needs trust. So if a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, anybody other than that individual themselves or their spouse establishes, it's a third party special needs trust. And it much less restrictive and no payback clause. It's, it's not the business of the government where that money goes. It's not that person, it's not the disabled person's money. Uh, so why do we do special needs trusts? Well, again, because they're not counted by the public benefits programs. I see people, uh, many people uh, over my practice who have, uh, uh, they, they're, they know their child's on SSI, so they're just sorry they have to do it, but they're going to disinherit them. Because they figure, well, anything that I do is just going to get in the way. Not true. That's a sad result. Unnecessary. Some people say, well, We'll give their sister a double share. Their sister will take care of them. It's one of those things that works if it works. You know, first off, you've got to ask, is this what I want to set my child up for? Well, that's a valid question. Uh, are they really in for that? Uh, and even if they are and, and are honest enough that they will keep that money segregated, that extra share, and use it only for their brother, uh, uh, fine and well. Even if all that is true, there are other things that can happen. That child you gave that extra share to support your disabled child could have financial problems, creditor problems, could get in a divorce and that money gets sucked into that, or could die first. And maybe your daughter, who would take care of her brother, now she has passed and, and the money is now belongs to your son-in-law, who might not feel the same way. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways it can go sideways. And it's unnecessary to plan for somebody with a disability in this fashion because you can set up a third party special needs trust very easily. And so it won't interfere with the benefits eligibility and will be able to provide for your child or family member uh, the way you would want. So third party special needs trusts are the intelligent foundation of special needs planning for families who have people with disabilities. They can ensure the quality of life above and beyond what SSI can do. I mean, it's not easy to live on 875 plus or minus dollars a month. Uh, but a special needs trust can step in and do the things that raise a quality of life. So, how, do, how does somebody set up one of these things? The most common way people do it is as a clause in their own family trust. So let's say you have, uh, hopefully, set up your own uh, uh, revocable family trust. Uh, you want to avoid probate and you want to make sure there's a good vehicle uh, for management of assets if you become disabled. Um, you can, and let's say you have uh, three children, one of which who has bipolar or a disability, another disability. And let's say for your uh, two children that uh, have no disability, you would say upon my death, upon the death of the survivor between my spouse and I, when we're both gone, 
pay our bills, divide, sell everything, liquidate it, get a chunk of money, and divide it in three chunks. The first two chunks, just give it outright to those children. However, for the chunk for our, our child with disability, put that in a special needs trust. Now that subtrust, we call it, sits right in your trust, unfunded, unused, not doing anything during your life. It's just sitting there waiting to come into existence when its time has come. For then, you don't put any money in it, you don't do anything. It's just a, what we, I would call as an attorney, a contingent subtrust. It's sitting there. It's not doing anything now. It's waiting for its day. And on that day, what's that day? That day is when the money is being spread out. Your other children take theirs outright. The child with disability gets their special needs subtrust funded. Now it comes into life, gets a tax, the ID number, becomes an entity and supports that child the way that uh, you would. So the other way that this is sometimes done is by setting up a freestanding special needs trust is its own trust. It can actually, it says irrevocable here. It can either be irrevocable, irrevocable or revocable. Um, and it's a, a, an independent, it's currently effective. You have to start it with at least a few bucks for it to be valid. You don't have to put more in that, but you might if you want. And it sits there as its own vehicle, and when uh, uh, and it, your estate plan, your regular trust would say, on my death, instead of funding the subtrust, <coughs> goes and funds this other trust that already exists. So why would somebody do that or not do that? Well, one, one reason not to do it is, uh, is that that's going to be more expensive uh, for an attorney to set up your trust plus an independent trust. The reason some people might do it one, if there are multiple people that would be possibly contributing in their estate plan into it, uh, that's a good reason. Another reason is if you have uh, a, a mom and dad may envision a point in time when, you know, we may not want to be as active uh, dealing with this disability as we are right now. We may want to retire, we may want to travel, we might want to do a few things. We may want to trust with a trustee other than us that is ready to go. Uh, if we you know, take a vacation when we go on vacation or take some time. So uh, again, that's, uh, uh, we do those too, but again, I'd say probably the majority of people uh, uh, just take it as a contingent subtrust in their regular trust, and that certainly does the trick. So again, as far as inheritances with a special needs trust, uh, they're going to keep their benefits. Uh, they. Uh, no payback clause in a third party special needs trust and it will get to supplement and raise the stand. There is no limitation for what a special needs trust uh, can pay for. Uh, there is no, it doesn't have to be a, some qualified disability expense. It can pay entertainment, it can pay for trips to Disneyland, whatever. Uh, entertainment if somebody likes, likes uh, the symphony, likes the Padres, whatever, whatever activities uh, uh, or, or it doesn't matter. It's whatever you say. Uh, without that, uh, what's going to happen is they're going to inherit that outright and then they would have to, if they want to keep, it's important to keep their benefits, they're going to have to set up a first party special needs trust with that money. Again, much more restrictive payback clause. You know, they could take their inheritance, set up a first party special needs trust and if they die a few la years later then the remainder of your estate, their share is all going to the government. Uh, so, not a good option. So, we said we'd look at the ABLE Act and estate planning and then take a look at how they integrate together. I was able to put that just basically on one slide here. Uh, third party special needs trust, contribution limits, unlimited. ABLE Act, $14,000 a year. SSI benefits, our contribution is going to result in a loss of SSI, third party special needs trust, no, it doesn't matter how much you put in it, it will not affect eligibility for any program like that. The ABLE Act, yes, after there's $100,000 in it. Loss of Medi-Cal, no, not in a third party, and not in an ABLE account either unless you go over the lifetime cap. Uh, payback clause, no. 
ABLE Act, yes. This is why I say one of the biggest, to me, the biggest disappointments about the ABLE Act. Nowhere else does third party money have a payback clause. That's only historically been for first party trusts, where it's the disabled person's own assets they put into there. So, as a family planning mechanism for a way to you to support somebody, that's, that's something to really consider. Um, so age limit on disability, no, yes. Income tax savings, you know, even that is, uh, can be illusory. Uh, I won't get into the details on that. Yes, an ABLE account grows tax-free, but there's enough credits and offsets with a disability trust that uh, you would have to be making a lot of income to really even notice that tax advantage. So, all that said, uh, I'm not saying ABLE accounts are a bad thing. I'm saying they are not what we hoped they would be. They are not a good alternative to third party special needs trusts. If what we're talking about is how as parents do we support a child with disability because of the caps and the payback clause, you've got much better options than that. But that doesn't mean they don't have their time and place. Uh, if it's a very small amount of money, that might work. Um, if they don't use Medi-Cal, you don't think they're ever going to use Medi-Cal. Uh, well, in that case, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about the payback clause. One of the biggest negatives is gone. And certainly if, uh, well, uh, if you are very, very wealthy, if you have more than $11 million in your estate, there are tax benefits to being able to get money outside of your estate. Uh, and if that describes uh, you, um, I want to be your attorney. Uh, please see me. Uh, figuring that doesn't describe too many of us. So, when does it make sense? My favorite is the relatively high functioning uh, beneficiary, maybe with a part-time job, somebody who can work but has SSI or has, has uh, SSI and is always sweating that $2,000 asset limit for their SSI. Um, getting into these situations where they're uh, trying to, uh, they're having to go out and try to spend that down and keep under. The ABLE Act is like a safety valve. They can put up to $14,000 a year into one of these accounts and let it go until it's 100,000 uh, and have a savings account and that will not interfere with their means tested benefits. So that's big. That's big if that describes uh, your, potentially describes your facts. Um, another way it might work in conjunction with larger special needs trusts, uh, if uh, they want to establish, if you want to give a little money to somebody so they can have some independence uh, with that account, again, mindful of the, of the $14,000 uh, limits, uh, you know, there's a vehicle for doing that as well. So uh, kind of a, uh, a, a stop loss damage control way of, uh, of giving somebody more than $2,000, which otherwise would interfere with their SSI, but not so much that you know, you're really having a, a, a risk, uh, or at least a risk beyond what you would assume. Yes? Could you take money out of the ABLE account and roll it into a special needs trust? If you saw that you had that need going forward, you started out with something like that, and there was $50,000? No, because that wouldn't be a qualified disability expense. At that point in time, you just let the ABLE count be, use it on qualified dis disability expenses until it was spent down, start your special needs trust at the same time, and, and you know, with time, they'd go like this. But otherwise, that would, uh, what, you, what you'd get is, uh, uh, is uh, taxed at the withdrawal plus a penalty. So easy <coughs> to keep it in and use it on disability, because there's surely going to be disability expenses and it's tax-free for those. So. Well, wouldn't um, you be able to do the same thing with the special needs trust? Like, if, we, if you aren't spending enough money, you can put the extra into the special needs? Well, the special needs trust, again, uh, uh, doesn't matter how much is in the special needs trust. It's not counted as an asset of that. I mean, when you, when you get up, like, you know, the 2,000 limit per month or whatever. Oh, they can't. No, no. Here, the problem with that is, if you're talking about them, they got a part-time job, they got some earnings, 
and you're worried about the 2,000, they can't tribute, contribute to your special needs trust because that'd be putting first party money in a third party trust and it would blow your third party trust to pieces. Uh, what they could do is establish a first party. They could establish a, uh, a first party special needs trust. They would have to have a well, it would have to have a payback clause, and they're relatively restrictive, and it's not easy to establish them, and et cetera. Uh, uh, not a good, uh, okay. So as I said, uh, oh, it might, uh, it's a convenient place to put smaller amounts of money. Maybe it's a small amount of, a, uh, of an inheritance. Again, something obviously would have to be under $14,000 uh, in a given year. So let's look at a couple examples see how that uh, plays out. So let's look at uh, Alex, who has bipolar disorder. Uh, he cycles rapidly, and he has never really been able to hold a job. Uh, he depends on SSI for his support. Uh, his grandmother died recently and left him uh, $17,000 that nobody knew about and nobody knew was coming. And uh, he's got his SSI and can't have any more than $2,000 now. Pre-able, what would we have done? Well, we would have gone through kind of a little mental checklist. The first thing we looked at and say, well, is there a possibility of reforming grandma's estate plan to have a third party special needs trust? That depends upon what state she was in and the law and the facts, um, but it's a possibility. Sometimes we do go in and, and try to deal with that by reforming the donors estate plan to do what they should have done, which is to give that money, put that money in a third party special needs trust. Um, another option is to put it in a, what's called a pool first party special needs trust. Uh, there are two kinds of first party special needs trusts, a pool trust, which are maintained by nonprofit uh, organizations, uh, and what we call self-settled ones, uh, ones that are customized, you do them yourselves. Uh, the pool ones are much more economical for a small amount of money. That's probably what you'd be looking at. But again, it's going to have a payback clause and administrative expenses. Another option would be, can you think of something to spend $17,000 on? Because as long as you spend it in the month of receipt, it's not considered an asset. In the month it's received, it's income. So, so that's traditionally what we'd look at. So. Frankly, going and doing a trust reformation of grandma's trust for $17,000 is not cost effective. I mean, the attorney's fees to go to court and do all that. If you added a zero beyond, behind that hypothetical, then that is probably what we would be trying to do. It would be cost effective at that point in time, but not for $17,000. Spend down, maybe it would work, but let's say instead, hey, Let's just spend down three grand instead of 17, sock the other 14 into an ABLE account. There it is for him. He maybe, instead of going out and trying to figure out what he could spend in one month, can you know, start think, thinking about maybe he's wanted a truck. Maybe he can start thinking about what, what do I want to do down the line. He doesn't have to worry about that while it's sitting there. Well, how can he spend it on a truck? Is that a qualified disability expense? Uh, 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 well, yeah, 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 excellent question. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, last time, uh, it was just a little while ago, and I forgot to do this, I was going to change it to a, a, a van, a disability van or another example, but yes, yes, exactly. Great, great. Uh, Anna, Anna also has bipolar disorder. Uh, she has been able, unlike Alex, to maintain a part-time job. She is, does have SSI, but she, she's been working. She's able to, uh, 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 you know, SSI has some programs where the, they favorably treat earned income as opposed to unearned income, so you can work a bit without losing your SSI. But she finds it difficult to stay under a $2,000 asset limit. Well, okay, she can use this ABLE account as a place to sock that extra money. And as long as it totals up less than 14000 or no more than $14,000 a year, she'll be just fine. And she can use that as a savings account until it gets up to $100,000. This is my favorite way to use an ABLE account. There are people that that describes their biggest problem. I've had families coming in saying like, you know, we have to go out in a month and think of, impulsive things to buy that make no sense. 
just because they got to spend down, you know, which that's just doesn't make much sense, does it? So, Sable Act uh, here. Uh, now, it is qualifying expenses. You know, I used to have a slide in here that had uh, a, a list of those, but I trimmed it out because it was my presentation was too long. Um, certainly, uh, anything that has to do with uh, disability treatment or therapy um, for somebody with a disability that concerns appliances and the like, uh, uh, with bipolar disorder, uh, it's. Uh, 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 Therapy, um, treatment, things that weren't cover, otherwise covered by, uh, it's a lot more restrictive than a special needs trust, which has no test. You can use assets out of a special needs trust for absolutely anything. Pardon? Ah, question is what if grandma had left her home? Home is an exempt asset. So that would have worked. That would have worked. Yeah. If, you know, um, I mean, uh, families who come to me with uh, bipolar, though, I mean, every disability has its own challenges, right? I mean, typically, they don't want to give something, the most valuable asset, outright. They're worried about what happens uh, if we get a, a, a big manic jag. What happens to that home? What happens? In, you know, uh, and they prefer grandma could have put that home in a special needs trust uh, instead of giving it to her outright and then the trustee would have been able to prevent any bad decisions and yet she still could live there have all the benefit of the house from her standpoint she would notice no difference I mean as you know other than, than legally who owned the home to keep her benefits, you betcha, because it wouldn't be counted. And there's another thing, there's this issue we're not going to get in called uh, ISM, in-kind support and maintenance. The trustee can you know, pay for expenses for a home that a trust uh, owns without uh, uh, having the same considerations about giving somebody money for food and shelter. So, Now a little bit, a little, uh, and, and about 10 minutes we got on uh, conservatorships. Uh, uh, so, whoops. Basically, a conservatorship is a court proceeding where somebody's appointed to make decisions for somebody else who is unable to make them themselves. You divide them, usually in California, to two constructs, the uh, <coughs> uh, conservatorship, the person and the estate. Let's look at the general types. There is the LPS conservatorship, we're going to talk about it for a minute. The probate, or sometimes called the general conservatorship. Limited conservatorships, we're not going to talk about guardians and guardian. guardianships are only deals with minors. Um, LPS conservatorships are the most serious. Uh, they require a finding of grave disability, which means unable by reason of a mental disorder to provide for their own food, clothing, and shelter, which is a pretty high bar, actually. It's very formal, right to a trial, uh, highest level of formality in setting it up, uh, because it's the most potentially serious deprivation of liberties. An LPS conservator can do something no other type of conservator can do, and that is put in a locked psychiatric facility and authorize the administration of whatever medications are needed, uh, whether or not that person wants that medication. <coughs> now, if that's the power you need, the only conservatorship that's going to do the trick is LPS. That's unfortunate because it's the hardest one to get. Biggest problem is, unlike the other kind where you can go down to the courthouse, and apply for a conservatorship, you can't apply for an LPS conservatorship. Only the county can do that. Only the government can do that. And they triage it pretty severely. It's, uh, um, they are, uh, they have more need than they have resources. And accordingly, 
they triage, and their triage is uh, that the, the gap between their needs and their resources is such that uh, uh, it takes a pretty serious case or something that just keeps constantly cycling back and back and back that they keep having to deal with. And finally, they say, okay, I guess this is you know, on the front burner. But families that deal with this find it very, very difficult to get on the front burner. Uh, they might have somebody that goes in uh, for the initial uh, proceeding, 72-hour hold, 14-day hold, but <coughs> as they try to uh, bridge the gap into a temporary conservatorship or an actual LPS conservatorship, they're going to see the county attrition away from that and say, ah, things seem to be going a lot better now. Well, maybe. The um, history of cycling 72 and 14, 72 and 14. That helps. But you know, as family, one thing that you know, you can't count on any particular admission. You can't count that anybody knows that history. This, and this is frustrating for you too, because, okay, you know the history. Not only do you know the history of the cycling, which is important, you might know some of the history. Oh, yeah, no, you, hey. We tried that drug two years ago, and you know what happened? You know, the exact opposite of what you wanted to happen. We had an idiosyncratic reaction. So you try to go and you share this knowledge, and you certainly should go and try to share this knowledge. Uh, but what might happen is, oh, well, they haven't signed a HIPAA waiver. We can't talk to you. Who? Like, we can't even verify they're here. You know, you, got, you may find yourself with nothing to say. Uh, it is extremely frustrating. I understand that. It's one of the uh, uh, hardest conversations I have with anybody in a family because uh, it's unlimited in what I can do. I have some pointers on how to advocate and try to break through, but uh, it's not an easy thing. Limited conservatorships, I'm going to skip over that. This is uh, for uh, only developmental disabilities, um, but the literature is, uh, is there. Uh, wanted, because I wanted to time this briefly about the general or probate conservatorships. These you can bring. You are in control of the process. And you can get a fairly robust set of powers. However, they will not include the power to put somebody in a psychiatric facility. What you, this would do is deal with a lot of the other life decisions, though, and choices. But you would still be in the same place if you actually have an event that needs a hospitalization, you're gonna to have to do just what you do now, is pick up the phone and call the per team or call the police or somehow somebody's going to you know, come in touch with this and in they go. Uh, but you as conservator will not be able to do that unless you're an LPS conservator. Um, uh, conservatorship of the person and the estate, most people try for it in the same petition. Uh, Somebody has a right to oppose these things. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, for conservatorship of the person, if you are conservative of the person, you can decide where they live and what that decision is. If it's conservatorship of the estate, you will be managing the assets, paying the bills, selling any property, investing, handling those things. Again, however, uh, the, per the proposed conservatee can object can say, I don't want that. I don't need that. Uh, and they, once they do that, uh, particularly if they can uh, do it uh, and present well, and this is another challenge with something like bipolar, is because it's not like somebody with advanced Alzheimer's or that no matter what, they're not going to present well. If you have somebody that can step right up and clear-eyed and say, I don't need this, Your Honor, and blah, 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 you considering the burden of proof and all that, you're going to have a tough time. Hard to do unless you get cooperation with the proposed conservative. Not impossible, uh, but you're going to need some pretty, uh, again, the nature of bipolar disorder is going to be something that cycles in and out. It's going to make it difficult for you to nail that down. Um, yes? Debts don't even pay or anything, 
we have no income pay it. Well, a couple, couple of thoughts there. Uh, well, conservator's not going to be personally responsible for that. Uh, so we have that. We also have the, uh, you know, can't get blood out of a rock. Uh, I mean, if it's just not there, there's nothing for creditors to collect from. Um, if you, as the conservator, can get that, uh, cooperatively get that conservatorship, one thing to keep in mind is debts that incur after that not, they're not liable for. Can I tell that creditor, hey, you, you know, extended this credit or this or entered this contract with somebody who's on a conservatorship. It's invalid, and it is invalid. It's not going to give you an advantage if when the conservatorship is established, you've got uh, all this uh, debt that's pre-existing. It's not going to make that go away. It might give you a good argument with the creditors, though. Oh, you know, you extended this credit to somebody that, you know, like six months later was put on a conservatorship, and they obviously were having problems when you extended this credit. I think you should uh, bargain seriously with us. You might be able to make that work. I'm going to skip uh, briefly to the alternatives. We have just a couple of minutes. There are alternatives, because this fits. Uh, your focused disability is are there alternatives to conservatorship? Well, somebody that can function sometimes quite well and other times not? Um, yes. When functioning well, let's sit down, think about them sitting down and doing powers of attorney for you. Durable powers of attorney, both financial, healthcare ones, uh, or a trust, depending on what they're, uh, if they have significant assets. Um, that really provides a good alternative. Well, not a great alternative because they can always revoke that later. You know, if you go manic and revoke that, and it doesn't keep them. The fact that you got a power of attorney doesn't keep them from going off and doing things themselves. It just means you can, uh, you know, have access to the accounts. Doesn't mean they can't. So, it's it's not a, a total solution. It doesn't have the authority of a conservatorship, but it can help. General powers of attorney, specialized powers of attorney. Uh, if they're not in existence, uh, you can think about if that person's willing to do it, about getting a power of attorney that appoints you, and maybe one that actually discusses the reason that, that power of attorney uh, is, uh, if, uh, is needed. Uh, Again, one of the potential limitations is they might revoke and countermand that, but maybe not. At least you've got a document that would give you access to something. Particularly healthcare ones. Particularly healthcare ones. You can get a HIPAA waiver ahead of time, get a healthcare power of attorney. When that hospital, when Mesa Vista or UCSD says, we can't talk to you, go, oh, yes, you can. Here, look, I've got these documents. Now I'm going to start telling you what, you what your record should have already known is what the last five admissions were like and what, what worked and what didn't work, et cetera. You, nobody else is going to give that history like you. The, the healthcare system just is not equipped to know what you know. So yeah, but at least that can be those healthcare power of attorney can help you plug in to make sure that is known. Uh, not going to cover uh, rep payees, that's not. So, I said we had a lot to go through. Uh, we did. Uh, we did it in our hour. Uh, we looked at all these things. We got it all covered. Um, I will stay a few minutes afterwards if anybody has. Well, I'll take a couple of questions if anybody has any, and, and then I will be uh, hanging on for uh, a little while as too. Thank you all for, uh, for coming. Yes, ma'am. What you want is if, if there is an estate plan and you have somebody who's on means-tested benefits who might be a beneficiary, you want to make sure that you have language in that trust that their share goes into a subtrust, into a special needs trust. It's more than just a clause. You're going to need a whole trust, a new trust inside your trust. Yeah. Well, you don't. You would probably end up what we would call as a restated trust. You'd end up still with a, a, a new document, one that still has your trust, but one has the subtrust. It's 
It's much more a, an easier way to do it than uh, just doing an amendment. Yes, sir. Um, as far as SSI is concerned, if we're providing some support now, would uh, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, the question was, well, you know, our daughter's on SS9, and we're uh, we're like to be providing some support. Is what we're doing a problem? Are we going to affect her her benefits? The answer is maybe. Here, there are three things you got to know. One, don't give them cash. Cash will result above 20 bucks will result in a dollar for dollar reduction in their benefit. And if you give them something that can be easily converted to cash, like a debit card, same thing. And don't anticipate that they'll never find cash. Uh, so, cash, no. Then there's something called in-kind support and maintenance, which is when, instead of giving them cash, you are paying for them. Now, if that thing you are paying for is food or shelter, that is what SSI thinks they're paying for. So if you're paying for it, they figure, don't need me. So they have a partial reduction in benefits when you're paying for food or shelter. But it is capped. It's not a dollar for dollar deduction. It's capped. Right now it's capped at $245 a month. So you could pay for $2,000 a month in rent and only get a $245 reduction in their SSI benefit. That might make sense for some people. Unless, of course, that $245 reduction is going to wipe out all of their SSI. They're only getting $100 SSI in their Medi-Cal. When you get a $245 reduction, it's wiping it out and you're losing your Medi-Cal. So whether or not it makes sense to pay food and shelter, that is a case-by-case -case analysis. A special needs attorney can help you, or anybody can know you that can walk through and see if it makes sense for you. The real value of a special needs trust is the last group, which is anything else, anything that is not tax and not food and shelter. There is no limit on what that special needs trust can do. No limit. Anything. Frival frivolous things included. Frivolity is one of the important parts of life, I think. So it can pay for entertainment, it can pay for serious things that you think are important, and it can pay for frivolous things. It depends upon the resources in that trust uh, and uh, you know, what the trustee thinks is the important facts. But that is the sweet spot of a special needs trust. Uh, so the SSI will pay the, the, uh, the SSI, you get the Medi-Cal, and the special needs trust to pay. When I say uh, uh, food and shelter, there's only uh, uh, seven what they call uh, shelter expenses. Uh, some things you might think of as shelter expense that are not considered a shelter expense, such as cable bill, phone bills, all those kind of things. You pay for any of that, no problem, no problem. Okay, any other questions? It seems to me that one of the places for these hidden accounts is going to be able to help them is, is precisely what we were just talking about in kind support maintenance because you can create a new account and put your money in there and then take it out and help them with your account without triggering that benefit deduction. So what you, your, your, your theory is money coming out of an ABLE account will not be counted as in-kind support. Yeah, well, and, and it wouldn't, that is not so much an ABLE rule, it's just a general rule of how Social Security treats distributions uh, as long as it's uh, not cash uh, or food and shelter. Uh, you can do what you need. And actually, this is not, these rules aren't a function of, oh, you have a special needs trust, you gotta pay attention to your food trust. This is like any income, if that person is on a means tested benefit and they're getting income from a third party, these are the rules that apply. Well, again, thank you all for coming. You're an attentive and intelligent audience, great questions. I appreciate the opportunity.
Uh, if uh, there's, uh, you have our contact information. If there's uh, anything you want to do, uh, we're happy to do a, we call our snapshot interview, take a look at the family estate plan. Uh, consultation with us is $350. Uh, if you fill out the intake form we send you and bring the documents, we'll have a very detailed uh, look at your plan. We'll review your existing estate plan, ask any, ask some questions, make recommendations, see what you want. Uh, most people that come and see us, that's, they're just doing a checkup and everything is fine. But uh, you're welcome to uh, call if we can, or otherwise uh, contact. Uh, I would recommend for families that are dealing with disability to contact a special needs attorney. Because your standard, I'm a specialist in trust and estate planning as well, and I can tell you most trust and estate attorneys don't know about the benefit program. And the core of what you need to be concerned about is estate planning by somebody who understands the benefits program so those two things stick together and don't do this. And that's the elder law term. So there's fewer of them, uh, but that's uh, uh, who uh, you really should be talking.